Okay, so welcome to our seminar for this week. Um, it's my pleasure today to welcome William, um, William Waits, um, who is going to talk about the application of graph transformation to something that we are all very familiar with by now, um, the, um, the uh, um, COVID pandemic and um, sort of specific aspects of this in particular communities and so on. So, so a new approach to modeling that probably goes beyond what, what other people have done. So we'll hear about that. So that's a very interesting application, of course. Um, so William has been moving around um, recently without actually moving very much, as far as I understand. So 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 he's been um, in Edinburgh with um, Vincent Dano, um, where I assume he learned about graph transformation and a few other things and, and, and stochastic modeling and so on, if you didn't know that before. Um, so, so as some of you may know, Vincent is, is working on modeling biological systems with his own particular brand of graph transformation. Um, and uh, William then used that background in order to apply that to different areas and presumably with different type, sort of adjusted formalisms and so on. So we hear about that. Um, so he was in London in the meantime, um, and then in, uh, in, is now at Strathclyde in, in Glasgow. Um, but as far as I understand, without actually moving anywhere physically, so, so still living in, in Edinburgh um, all the while, which is quite, quite, quite good. Um, he's also, as we just learned, a Chancellor's Fellow in Edinburgh, as well as having accepted a lecturer position there, which means that he's supposed to concentrate on, on research. So maybe we'll see new things coming out soon from him as well. So, so we'll keep an eye on him, I think, also in the future. So please, Willem, uh, uh, go, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Just a minor correction, Chancellor's Fellow at Strathclyde, not Edinburgh. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, great. It's, I'm, I'm very happy to be here and thank you for uh, for inviting me. Um, I just want to say as well, I'm very happy to have questions, interruptions in the in the as I'm as I'm speaking, if something's not clear, there's a, something interesting or, a, you know, so don't don't hesitate to speak up and and interrupt me. I don't mind one bit. Um, and yeah, let's, um, let's get started. So can I move the slides forward? Yes, there we are. So most of what I am going to speak about today is, uh, contained in this paper, which you can find on the archive. And I just want to start with, um, acknowledging and thanking my collaborators on this who span uh, several disciplines and uh, and several countries, and uh, yeah, it certainly would have because uh, one of the things that we're going to do is we're going to look at uh, a little bit of immunology and a little bit of um, a little bit of epidemiology, and um, we're going to use a stochastic graph rewriting to implement models of this and. Um, yeah, that's, um, I don't know that much about immunology, and it turns out to be quite complicated. So it's very helpful to have people who know about this as collaborators, and similarly for epidemics. But if you're, if you, yeah, if you, if you want to read the paper, there is the, there's the paper that contains most of, most but not all of what I'm going to, going to show just now. So as motivation, um, this was the motivation that started. It actually, it started before. It started before with um, attempting to look at questions like what is the uh, best way to use limited testing resources, right? If you have some rapid tests, as which when we first started looking at this, these didn't exist, but we thought that they might exist soon. If you have rapid tests and you have PCR tests and you can only do a certain amount of each, uh, what is the best way to deploy them in what situations, right? And one of the things that we found when we were doing the modeling of this was, um, well, we really had no idea at that time, this is early 2020, early mid 2020, we really had no idea at that time what the response looked like over time, over the course of an infection to these tests. And it was a while before we started seeing some data that would tell us this. And this is an example of, of um, this is an example of some of that. So this is uh, this uh, was some colleagues at the London School, Joel Halliwell and Tim Russell in particular, 
who used some data from the SIREN study, which is uh, which did, PT, did PCR tests of health workers in London at a particular hospital in London uh, and tried to uh, keep track of when they were most likely to have been infected and um, and uh, what the uh, what the cycle uh, the cycle count value the CT value of the PCR tests that they did was and to try to estimate uh, what the chance of getting a positive PCR result over time in days since of infection uh, looked like. So the data that they collected um, by Houlihan and colleagues is shown in this is shown in the kind of gray cloud in the back. And the sort of uh, irregular black line is the is the is the mean of that data, and um, Helliwell and Russell and and colleagues did a statistical model and fit this um, the blue region or blue distribution uh, on top of this, and they said, okay, here's a statistical model for how we think this looks, right? So this is all very interesting, and it's useful to have it's useful to have this kind of trajectory of the chance of getting a positive result over time. But uh, I started wondering, well, what kind of mechanism could be behind this? What process, rather than doing a, a statistical model that fits this and reproduces it quite well, um, you know, what, what kinds of processes could produce such a thing? And a large part of the talk today is going to be about how we go about imagining these processes and seeing how they work. Um, we're going to use uh, a kind of graph rewriting. Um, let me just move this thing here. We're going to do this in a rule-based way. So um, those of you, which might be many people in the audience here, uh, who are familiar with graph rewriting, this will look, this will probably look familiar, right? I mean, it's, uh, you might think it's some kind of a push-out arrangement, whether it's single push-out or double push-out or sesqu push-out. I'm not sure. Actually, I think I think we I think we established that it was sesqu push out rewriting. But in any case, you have a thing called a rule and has a left hand side and a right hand side. And I think of the rule, the left hand side of the rule as a pattern, and the right hand side as the replacement of this pattern. This um, this diagram here uh, comes from um, Pierre Boutelier's paper about the um, about the the CASIM simulator in the Kappa language. And you imagine these rules operating on a mixture of things that look like molecules, and the molecules can have these atomic things called agents, which you might imagine correspond to atoms if you're thinking of molecular biology. Um, we don't really think of atoms in, these, in this model that's going to come, but um, the left-hand side embeds into this mixture. It could embed in, I think, in this case, three different ways, but we pick one and we replace that left-hand side with whatever the right-hand side is. Uh, and this rule operates at some rate, in this case, gamma. And uh, yeah, so this is, the, um, this is the kind of mechanism that we're going to use uh, in order to create these models. Um, some nomenclature and uh, some nomenclature about these particular kinds of graphs and this and different ways of thinking thinking about what these graphs or what these patterns patterns are. Um, so on the right hand side there's we have a notion of well we call each of these things a and the you know the circle and the small circles on the edge of it uh, we call these agents. Um, agents are said to have a type in this case there's one called a and there's one called b type a and type b Agents have sites, which are um, they're generally in in principle you could use a site as uh, uh, in in both of these ways, but in but uh, normally we normally we use them in one of two ways. You have a site that can accept a bond, and it can be bound or it can be unbound. And if it's bound, the other end of it has to be a site on some other agent. And you have sites that are just kind of a um, hmm, they're just a uh, just just a well just a you know just a label and they have a state and the state is drawn from some kind of a finite vocabulary. Uh, in this case, agent A has a site called U that is in state X, whatever X is. 
uh, the B, uh, you'll see we've dropped a whole bunch of a whole bunch of syntax there, and that's something that I'm going to do quite a bit, just just to minimize clutter, right? In this case, if it's clear from the context that you know maybe B only has one site, and so why bother writing the name of the site? We just say the state of this is the state of whatever site B has is called Y. Um, uh, it's just an abbrevi it's just abbreviated for clarity and for removing visual clutter. Uh, in the upper left, we have one and a different way of representing exactly the same thing, right? So here we have uh, sort of in the in the left center and the right center, we have two agents, and they have mm, an edge to some vocabulary of types, uh, and it picks out a particular type there, an edge to A and an edge to B. And the sites of these agents, well, these are vertices in a graph, and um, these sites have names, P, Q, U, R, S, V. Um, some of them have, uh, there's a bond between Q and S. I had to pick a name for it because I'm writing things out in full here, whereas I didn't bother naming it in the diagram on the right. Um, some sites might have just a value drawn from a fixed vocabulary, X and Y, that are shown there in orange. Another way of thinking of it in the bottom left is uh, very much like uh, the way that Trico was representing things yesterday. Well, imagine these are just mm, objects or these are even rows in a table of A's and a table of B's. And there are, uh, you know, and there are entries in these records for each of the site. And each of these sites can have a value and the value can be some kind of a thing that looks like a foreign key. If you imagine this looks like a relational database table. Um, R, we haven't specified, it's possibly bound, so we don't know what's in there, we don't care about it, we probably wouldn't mention it. Um, P is not bound, uh, U has state X, and so on and so forth. And in the bottom right, this is the same thing again, but written down in the syntax of the CASIM simulator, which is, of course, machine-readable, and you can feed this into the program, and the program will, um, you know, will uh, can conduct stochastic simulations of models written in this, which is, means we need a text-based format to write this in. It's not very good at understanding pictures, even though I prefer the pictures and I'm going to mostly use pictures. So, okay, these are the things that, the, the, these are the way we make agent patterns and everything is going to be built on top of this. This and the, you know, the, the previous idea there of replacing agent patterns with replacements. Um, so, okay. Let's start off just to just to get started here with a sort of naive uh, kind of model that is intended to recreate this, right? So if you look at this, we look at this picture. We're not even going to bother with biological realism yet. We look at this picture and we see the curve goes up and it goes down. It turns around at some point. So okay, what might a model uh, of that look like in this um, in this formalism? Well, okay, so we say well here's an agent. It doesn't have any bonds or anything. It's very simple, right? It can be going up or it can be going down, and it has n. Uh, the n is a counter, how far up it is, and or how far down it is, right? And again, the same thing in the kind of Rosetta Stone-like way. This is written down a couple of tables or written down in the you know in the CASIM simulator syntax, right? Um, in the tables and the CASIM simulator, I haven't written this on the on the pictorial version. But, uh, I mean, I suppose we have to give a name for these things. It needs a type. So we'll call it P, P for person. Um, even though in infectious diseases, we often talk about individuals and not person, uh, we use P for person because if you use I, it gets confusing because often I is used for people who happen to be individuals who happen to be infectious. So P for person, and that will continue kind of throughout. So, okay, so here are some rules, and we'll see in a moment why I call them ladder rules. Uh, we have three rules, just as described, right? Uh, rule number one says, if I'm in the state of going up, I go up. I, in I increment this number n. And at a certain point, I turn around. I don't change the n, but I just stop going up and start going down. And if I'm going down, well, okay, I'm in the state of going down, I decrement the n, as long as n as long as it uh, remains greater than zero. And this already, we can see one of the nice things about how constructing models in this rule-based way, um, we can see one of the nice things. The nice thing is that um, it immediately kind of gives you a narrative, 
right? This is a bit of a story about what's happening, right? Things go up, they turn around, they come down. It's a very simple story. It's not very complicated. It's just three rules. But each element of the story corresponds to a rule. And this is one of the things that I like because if you're, you know, it, it makes models explainable in that way. And of course, it also, you know, they're also composable, right? I mean, I can add more rules. I can add more things to the story. And this just creates a composite bigger model. And we'll do that a little bit later. So um, this particular one is simple enough that we can write down a Petrinet for it, right? And this is, of course, why I call them, why I've been calling these these particular ones ladder rules, right? Um, this is written down. Uh, this is, I mean, this is exactly the same model. We can see how the Petrinet version is more verbose. Um, there's more to it. It's much more complicated. Um, but uh but yeah we can and it has the shape of a ladder which is why as i say why i've been calling these ladder rules so if we do this oh right here is that same program that same model written down in the kappa language of the the casim simulator i won't go over this in great detail um there is uh, one small thing that I will mention because I noticed that one of the one of, that uh, Jérôme Ferret, one of the one of the developers of Casim, is uh, joined. Um, you'll notice there is something stuffed into comments here. There's a sort of iterate uh, statement that essentially goes and takes these rules or these rules or these these observables as well, uh, and duplicates them, incrementing the value of i, uh, and that. Uh, has to do with, it mainly has to do with the fact that uh, counters for counting um, numerical values is a relatively new feature in Casim, and uh, it turns out that um, sometimes you just have to repeat the rules uh, in order to do this because of the, um, uh, it's a technical detail, it's not terribly important, but the point of, it, the point of this is, is what we see here corresponds directly at one-to-one -one correspondence essentially between the version that I gave of this in pictures with three rules and the version that's written down for the simulator. So we can tell that what the simulator is given is the same thing that I'm talking about in my slides and it's short and it's succinct and it really doesn't contain very much other than these three rules and some and some initial conditions and some instructions for what to look at, what to count, so we can have some output and plot it. And if we do this we get something like this, right? Um, and okay, it's not, it goes up and it goes down. It's not, um, uh, it's not great, but um, it's kind of not completely wrong. Um, immediately though, we get an interesting thing if we look at the cross section at each time of that distribution that's written down, you know, the distribution that's depicted here, this is uh, the bands are standard deviations. And if we look at what that distribution looks like at each point in time, well, not all the way, just to 14, there's only so much room on the slides, um, but we see something already that's quite interesting, right? We see that we start at time zero. This is a population of, mm, I think I did a thousand individuals. They start in exactly the same state at time zero with uh, a probability of getting a positive PCR of one out of 10, because we have to truncate, right? And the distribution of viral load, because we're doing the simulation stochastically and the point at which you turn around and go, well, the rate at the, the weight at which you climb up the ladder is in stochastic increments and the time at which you turn around is chosen from a distribution. So what we get is a distribution of how uh, high up the ladder individuals are that changes with time. And this already is quite interesting because um, you see, as you get towards later times, well, most individuals have climbed all the way back down the ladder, right? Most individuals are no longer infectious and they've cleared the virus and so on and so forth, but you do get stragglers. You get a kind of long-tailed distribution of stragglers. So that is interesting because it's something that we see kind of in kind of in reality. It's a little bit wrong here because the model's a little bit wrong, it doesn't quite fit, you know, we'll do better. So uh, not only does it not quite fit, but it also kind of lacks a convincing biological explanation, right? This isn't that much better than a statistical model of what's going on, because I just looked at it, I looked at the curve, I said, it goes up, it turns around, it goes back down. Maybe we can do better. So, okay, let's do better. 
So we'll start with some sort of um, some sort of biological thing. We imagine there's a virus, right? There's a virus. It's it's attached. So um, recall that the filled in circles on the sites indicate that there is a bond. So this is a population of virus. We're going to interpret it as a population of virus that is bound to an individual. We don't know what individual it is. We don't care. We don't write it down. We don't want to have to bother with extra context. We just all we really need to know for this step is that the um, there's a population of virus and it's bound to somebody. And we say that this pop the virus replicates, right? So the virus replicates, um, and we're going to use this counter to keep track of just orders of magnitude how much virus there is in this population in this particular individual, right? So we're going to say this n, this you know, subscript, this site that carries a numerical value, um, is going to represent the logarithm of the size of the population of virus. And that's easy. So what all this is, is this is exponential growth, really, of virus. Um, it's linear growth in log space. Um, there are um, plenty of immune models, in fact, there are plenty of immune models that will have some sort of a limiting mechanism, which is normally a limiting mechanism of the virus has to infect cells and there's only a finite population of cells. However, we might be justified in not having that limit, limiting mechanism here because certainly for something like SARS-CoV-2, if you're infected with it and it starts actually exhausting the potential population of cells to um, to infect, well, you'd be dead. Um, so we know that whatever's happening, um, it never gets that big. So, okay, virus replication, fairly simple, right? Uh, we're going to skip, we're going to make a vast, simple tons of vast simplifications here, but we're going to skip the innate immune response entirely. It doesn't appear in this model, and it's an interesting thing that should be in this model. And we're also going to skip the kind of startup machinery. Um, so the startup machinery where once you are infected and you get cells that are, um, you know, that have been infected with the virus, various chemicals are produced, cytokines, which attract other cells like um, dendritic cells, which essentially are like big mops, right? They go and they mop up fragments of virus, entire virus, and they go and bring them to um, areas in your lymph nodes called germinal centers. And there is where the adaptive response that we'll look at starts. So we're going to skip all of that machinery, and it would be a fascinating thing to um, include that in this, um, in this model, but haven't done it. There's a lot that goes on in the immune system. So what goes on in these germinal centers now? We have in the germinal centers, we have uh, helper T cells, which don't appear in this, in this rule, um, that take the bits of antigen, the bits of virus that have been brought there by the dendritic cells, and they present them to a population of B cells. And the B cells are very important and they do something that is um, really quite fascinating that also doesn't appear here, that it would be really nice to, I'll talk a little bit about that later, about how, what we might need to include that. But what the B cells do is um, essentially they execute an evolutionary algorithm, right? And it happens as follows. So once they are presented with some bit of, um, some bit of antigen, um, the antigen binds, so the B cells express on their surface proteins that are exactly like antibodies. They're exactly the same shape, just the same shape. And when the B cells, uh, when a bit of antigen glues, it matches with this antibody that the B cell produces, <clears throat> that B cell starts proliferating rapidly. And some of them differentiate and then they start producing antibodies later on. Um, how the cells find what the right antibody to express is, is they mutate. They mutate very quickly, about 10 to the 6 times more quickly than other cells tend to mutate. And uh, what this means is you end up with this population of B cells that is rapidly mutating just the section of its genome that corresponds to this, um, to the antibodies that it will produce and what it, produ what it expresses on its surface. And the ones that match the virus best 
gets selected for because the uh, bit of antigen glues itself onto there and this triggers that particular cell with that particular genome to start prolifer proliferating. And this optimization process is called affinity maturation, right? It's a process by which the B cells become tuned to match um, proteins of the, of the virus. So there's also a lot going on there and none of that is present in this model. <laughs> and we're just going to say that the B cells, uh, we're going to interpret this M here as a uh, quantification of how mature this population of B cells is, right? It just increases and it increases proportionally to the amount of virus there is, because if you think about it, it doesn't have to be proportional. That's just the simplest guess we could make about what this rate might look like. But if you think about it, um, you know, if there's not very much virus at all, there's not very much that's going to go in the germinal centers. And so the B cells aren't going to have very much to work with to do their affinity maturation. And the more virus there is, the more um, there is, the more the affinity maturation will be possible. Hang on, I'm ringing. This is a very inconvenient time to have my telephone ring. Um, no, no, can't talk. Um, right, uh, so we say that the B cells uh, are maturing in um, uh, at a rate that has to do with the amount of virus there is. And we're going to play the same, this very same game again. We're going to say that, well, the antibodies are produced by these B cells, and we're going to suppose that they're produced, again, in proportion to how mature the B cells are, right? So if you have a population of B cells that are completely immature and haven't had any time to uh, tune themselves to match the virus, they're not going to produce any antibodies or not very much. If they uh, have been stewing for some time and tuning themselves for some time and optimizing the response for some time, well, they're going to produce more useful antibodies. And here, this N uh, subscript this M N site is a, again a counter for the for the for A the antibodies, and we're going to interpret this also as a measure as a logarithmic measure. So it's sort of the same kind of thing as the measure of the size of the virus population. And finally, um, well, we have neutralization of the virus happens right. So this is a fully developed kind of immune response here, and we're going to decrement the amount of virus according to um, well, some constant times the amount of antibodies that we have, right? So we imagine, so this is a little bit like the, uh, like the, the ladder rules that we had earlier, but it's kind of more complicated and indirect, right? It's more complicated and indirect, but it has an account that is a not completely ridiculous um, story account of what of what is going on in the adaptive immune response right you have the um, you know you have the virus replicates you have uh, the presence of virus causes the B cells to mature the more mature the B cells are the better they are at producing antibodies and the antibodies go and gum up the virus and stop it from invading cells and um, you know and allow it to get mopped up and and eaten by macrophages and whatnot. Um, and, of course, we say, well, okay, if the count of the virus gets down so low as to be undetectable, or zero, um, then it just falls off, and we don't have, um, and we don't have this um, population of virus anymore. And we end up with a person again, but with no virus population. Um, now, we're going to make a key assumption that is probably not, it's not unreasonable, but it's also probably not right, um, or at least it could probably be refined. We're going to say the likelihood of a positive PCR test is proportional to the logarithm of the viral load. Um, these quantities are sort of, um, you know, are uh, sort of of the same, of the same shape. Uh, you know, the PCR mechanism uh, basically involves uh, taking a sample, right? And if there is some virus in this sample, each cycle of PCR will, well, maybe it'll double it, maybe it'll multiply it by 10 times, but it's also an exponential process. And the 
uh, you know, so your cycle threshold that you have where you consider something to be positive is also a logarithmic measure. So we imagine that the likelihood of a positive PCR test is something to do, is some sort of a logarithmic measure that has something to do with viral load. We assume this, and it turns out to work quite well, right? If we do this and we, you know, and we fit to find whatever the constant of proportionality is, uh, we get it's quite a good fit, right? It's quite um, uh, it's as good as the statistical model. It's a little bit different. It doesn't have the, um, you know, it doesn't have the little little foot at the beginning of it. But then we also don't have the innate immune response in this model at all. So this is probably not bad. I mean, it seems reasonable. And again, if we um, if we go and look at the distribution of um, of, uh, of viral load as a function of time, we get again something fairly similar, right? We see uh, we see how this how this changes how this is likely to change in time with everybody starting at the same spot. We get after a while we get a kind of uh, a kind of long tail. Uh, interestingly, by the time you get to about fourteen days, about two weeks, about this quantity of time that is on the screen, what you find is about eighty percent of the infectiousness is um, concentrated in about twenty percent of the individuals. Uh, that's I don't necessarily think that this model is detailed enough to put a lot of stock in that number. However, the general idea that um, there is heterogeneity in the population in terms of viral load, uh, and there is some biological basis in conjunction with uh, behavior, of course, right? Uh, there's some biological uh, basis for uh, super spreading events. Now, this has to be understood very carefully, right? Because if somebody happens to have very high viral load and they're isolating, there's going to be no super spreading event. You need something else as well. However, um, what you will also get is many individuals with lower viral load that will, you know, even if they are um, participating in, in gatherings and so on and so forth, they may not be the trigger for this. So this is this it requires a little bit of subtlety to, um, you know, avoid over interpreting. Nevertheless, what we recover here is heterogeneity in the viral load in the population, which is something that matters. Um, so that's interesting. And it's interesting also that, um, you know, you might look at this and you might say, well, okay, this is all very interesting. However, the basic mechanism underneath this, um, the, st um, the stochastic, um, hang on, the doorbell has just rang. Um, let's hope it doesn't ring again. Um, anyways, um, the, uh, right, the basic mechanism that produces this heterogeneity is present in the much simpler, much less, you know, less biologically realistic model, which, um, essentially shows that the stochastic, uh, the un underlying stochastic process matters actually quite a bit in producing this kind of heterogeneity. And that's, I mean, that's interesting. Um, now we're going to make another assumption here. We're going to make an assumption that says the rate of transmission is proportional to the logarithm of the viral load, right? We're going to say um, uh, there are there are, there's huh, there are several different. Uh, uh, one second, I must get the door. I'm very sorry. Um, My apologies. I'm back. Very sorry for that. Um, this is, um, yeah, the perils of giving a talk while working from home in a pandemic with uh, children coming and going. Um, right. So we make another assumption about how uh, we're going to wonder, well, 
um, what does this have to do with transmission, right? I mean, this has all been uh, looked at in terms of individuals that are not interacting with each other at all. Um, if you want to have individuals interacting with each other in the way that makes sense for uh, studying infectious diseases, well, you need some way of transmitting the infectious disease. There are numerous ways that you could try to relate viral load to transmission rate. Um, some people have just done it directly. Some people have made an, made, a, made an assumption like we do here that says, oh, logarithm of viral load has to do with transmission rate, which kind of makes sense, right? Because, you know, if I have one extra virion, it's not going to do anything to the transmission rate. But if I have 10 times as many, that's going to, um, that's going to make a fairly big difference. Um, again, there is uh, plenty here that is not represented. You know, for example, if I have a higher viral load, spatial uh, within within the body effects matter, right? If I have a high viral load in my upper respiratory tract, that might have something to do with transmission. If I have a high viral load, I don't know, in my intestines, well, probably not. Nevertheless, we're going to imagine what happens if the transmission rate is proportional to the logarithm of viral load. And we're going to add in a transmission rule, right? And this is a well-mixed transmission rule, so we don't imagine that these two individuals are... Um, connected to each other in any way. That's something, again, we'll speak about later. Um, and uh, it turns out that once we have it phrased like this, so it is, it's actually quite natural what it looks, what transmission looks like, right? This is an individual with a bit of virus, some amount, N, and an individual that's got no virus. And they go into this rule and out comes an individual that still has virus, and then they've given a little bit to the second one who now has a small amount. Um, we can as well establish observables that correspond to the standard, um, you know, commonly used in infectious disease modeling um, quantities by looking for patterns in this graph. And you can look for the pattern of somebody being susceptible is exactly somebody who has no virus, right, and who also does not have an established immune response. So they've got no B cells that are doing anything useful. Part of what was skipped here was some uh, housekeeping setup that says, as soon as you're infected, um, attach a population of B cells. But that's not super interesting. And is, uh, yeah, I mean, unless it were elaborated to include the entire mechanism. An, infect an infected individual and now is somebody who has, it doesn't matter what state their immune response is in, but what it does matter is that they have a population of virus that's attached to them. They have a, they you know they're infected. That's that's what infected means. Um, and a recovered or removed individual is going to be somebody who has an established immune response but has no virus. And uh, we don't need in the transmission rule. See, normally you would say it has to be a susceptible individual and an infectious individual have to come together in order to uh, in order to have a transmission event. Here we don't need that at all. Right, if um, the the blue p in the in the in the rule happens to have an established immune response, well, they might get a little bit of virus, and, and they're not infected right now. They might acquire a little bit of virus, and then their their established immune response will clear it immediately. So we don't actually need any of that sort of artificial separation of uh, the population into these into these. Uh, um, you know, into these uh, into these partitions, but it is helpful to have these partitions in order to look at it and to be able to describe the process of what's going on in similar terms to what we're used to in infectious disease modeling. And if we do that and we plot these in, uh, these observables, we get something that looks like an epidemic curve, which is what we would expect. Um, we have the. Um, uh, yeah, we have, because there is uh, a fair amount of heterogeneity in these underlying stochastic processes, there's fairly big, um, you know, fairly big uncertainty envelopes around these. Again, each band is, is a standard deviation in this case. Um, and uh, now we're going to do something that is very interesting, I think. Uh, we're going to pick some spots on this red curve. 
right? We're going to pick the middle, you know, the 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 point at which um, the uh, the epidemic has peaked, uh, and we're going to pick um, a sort of well-developed increasing epidemic halfway up the curve and halfway down the curve, and we're going to choose the points on the curve that happen to be when uh, there is the same fraction of the population that is infected. And we're going to do this also early on and late in the epidemic, right? So we have very early and very late in the epidemic. We have kind of rising epidemic sort of in the middle and falling epidemic sort of in the middle, and then we have the peak. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at um, what does the viral load distribution look like at these different points. And if we do this, we do see that indeed they are different, right? We have, um, you know, early on in a rising epidemic, we tend to find more uh, individuals with lower viral loads. Late in a falling epidemic, we find more individuals with a higher viral load, and, um, and this is this is this is explainable, right? It's also a similar result to what uh, James Hay and colleagues found by looking in the data, right? And they found that they could use this in order to estimate things like the reproduction number from just a sparse random sampling of um, of individuals. And uh, this makes sense, right? So you know, early on you have individuals being infected more and more and faster and faster. So you have more and more individuals that have just been infected and are early on in their infection, right? Uh, later on, you have, well, maybe most people have been recovering, but you have some stragglers, right? You have some people who have some longer lived infections and so have higher viral loads, and you'll find more of them later on in the epidemic. And, you know, in the middle, you have something a little bit in between. And uh, recovering this result as well, and showing that it follows from the uh, both the heterogeneity in the viral load and just the trajectory of how the um, how the viral load goes over the course of an infection, it was interesting to be able to recover this um, as well. And right, okay, so some observations here. I mean, one I spoke about in some detail, right? There's, there's, there is no innate, there's no concept of innate immune response in this model. Um, and, you know, both because it has an effect, uh, it has an effect on the virus, the secretion of interferon and so on. And it also has a role in starting the adaptive immune response. So that's entirely absent. It would be nice to put in as an interesting area of research that I'm pursuing. Uh, the population here is completely unstructured, right? So it's mass action kinetics for individuals encountering each other and um, becoming infected, becoming exposed. Now, it would be very nice to be able to have more structure in the population, right? It would be very nice to have, uh, first of all, a standard thing to do, which could be done here. It would just be, um, it would, it would be... Um, maybe less efficient to simulate, um, is age stratification, right? Because different age groups encounter uh, different age groups in, you know, with different frequencies. Um, but also, uh, you know, some underlying, uh, an underlying graph of, an underlying contact graph. It would be nice to be able to run, if people do, epidemics on networks. In fact, I have a, uh, a, um, a simulator that uses a language that is similar to the CASIM language in order to do simulations on that kind of graph, although it's not uh, uh, it's not nearly fully featured enough to use for many things. Um, but we might like that we might like to do that, right? We might like to say, well, you know, it's not equally likely that every individual contacts every other individual. And people live in households, they go to workplaces, they um, you know they shop in shops, they do all that sort of thing. It'd be nice to have that. So in order to be able to accomplish that, I mean, these are now, now this is a wish list slash uh, future research that it would be interesting to do. One of the things that you might like to have is rules, topologically parameterized rules. What do I mean by that? I mean, uh, well, you could have parameterized rules, right? Most of the rules that we have 
in this model were parameterized by a number, right? The amount of virus or the amount of the affinity of the B cells or the amount of vent, so on and so forth. So that is something that appears both in the uh, the the internal state of a site, and it appears in the rate. <clears throat> that is one thing that would be useful to be able to do, but it's not quite what I mean. What I might also like to do is I might like to say, well, A can interact with B so long as the site, a particular site, doesn't matter, site on A and site on B have the same state, whatever that state is. And that would give the ability to very easily, uh, without having to, it can be done now, it can be done now if you just enumerate the, um, enumerate the possible internal states and copy the rule many times. But th what that would enable is without having to do that, without having to copy the rule many times, you'd be able to have spatial partitions, right? So you'd be able to say, take exactly this same model that we have here, modify slightly the um, modify slightly the transmission uh, the transmission rule to say that both individuals have to be in the same place and then you could have a spatially compartmentalized version of this right and you could have transport between them and you can do all of this sort of thing that would be very helpful it would also be helpful um, to have a kind of hierarchical rule sets like much of what is going on here uh, seems like it should have the flavor of, well, immune response, um, you know, my immune response to some virus within me is sort of inside me and has nothing to do and needn't be mixed up with, if we're doing a simulation, the uh, immune response of somebody else, right? Those could be done independently. They can be done in parallel. Uh, and so this kind of hierarchical uh, arrangement would also be very useful. And you could use that same arrangement to do the spatial separation that I mentioned a moment ago. All of that, uh, while I was looking at this, I found a, um, a very interesting paper that I wasn't aware of before um, by um, Jean Crivin, Robin Milner, and um, Angela Troina called Stochastic Biographs, which included, in fact, a suggestion that Cassim should be extended to be able to do this. And I believe that that, so by, so that, that is enough to capture the um, parameterized rules that I'm talking about and the hierarchical rule sets that would make it um, very, uh, very much easier to do these kinds of simulations where there's um, spatial separation. These are just things that I would like to be able to do. And with that, I think I think we're done, and perhaps there are questions. All right. I don't know. Sorry, did you hear that? Someone said recording stopped. Uh, I heard I re recording in progress, and I heard. Re okay. Yeah. okay. Never mind. Hmm. Yes. I don't. I don't know what that's about. Yeah, I don't know. Um, right. I mean, we're recording anyway, so so maybe someone pressed record on 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 Zoom in addition to the to the to the um, recording that goes as a live stream to um, to YouTube. So so. But, uh, she apologized. Uh, Sorry, my mistake. <laughs> okay, doesn't matter. Yes. Uh, so. I have a question. Hello. Yeah, please, please, please go ahead. Yes. Uh, I I'm, I just uh, uh, I noticed that uh, uh, in your model uh, uh, your model depends on the distribution of uh, viral load. And, well, uh, yes. Well, it it doesn't depend on it uh, reproduces. It, it, and how far could we uh, rely on this uh, hypothesis? I mean... Well, um, I think uh, we do know that there is... Uh, we do know that there is a distribution of viral load that varies among individuals. We know that empirically. Uh, 
Yes, that, that's true. But uh, but in your model, the distribution, I mean, uh, it's uh, linked to the whole uh, population, like at the beginning of the epidemics, the viral load is low, then at the peak. This you mean? Yes, that's yes. what I mean. Um we know yeah yeah this is so this is interesting this we also know this empirically empirically yes uh, my observation is that uh, uh, how can you uh, uh, justify this on uh, uh, i mean uh, micro uh, micro i mean uh, on more hypothesis um uh, you can uh, I mean, uh, in your model, you can't uh, just uh, say, uh, we noticed this, uh, etc. Maybe uh, you will have a more interesting model if you can uh, justify why, uh, I mean, uh, uh, endo endogenous, uh, uh, offer an endogenous explanation to that from your model. Well, I suppose, um, so the... Um... So I think I think we I think I think you can have that right because uh, well first of all there are no distributions of any kind that are put into the model to begin with right um, so this is the first thing so whatever this is we know that it arises endogenously mm -hmm. um, if you do not have transmission we say there's no transmission what you get that's a it's, it's the same picture here. Right. If you have no transmission, what you get is this kind of pattern. And if we want to understand why we have this kind of pattern, so here there's no transmission, right? So there's no everybody is infected at time zero. There's no there's no people getting infected at different times. So we know we have a distribution of viral load, even in that case. Now this one arises from a fairly complicated model. Right, it's got some idea of you know immune response and so on and so forth in it, but the same, almost the same, you know, very similar, arises from a much much simpler model, and it's easy to see why this arises, right? Because this comes, so this is the same thing, right? I mean, it's very similar. It's truncated. I didn't do it in as many uh, in in as many steps. Um, but, you know, it arises from that model. Why does it arise? Well, it arises because the, um, you know, the increasing of, well, in this case, the, the, the increase of viral load is a stochastic process. The, um, you know, the, the change of direction a stochastic process and the decrease of stochastic process and this necessarily gives you some kind of a distribution and it happens that the distribution looks like this and then when we, when we replace that model with one that has a better biological explanation of what's going on we find that this even though it might not be quantitatively co correct is certainly qualitatively correct it's that same kind of process right and it's just i mean if you want to think in terms of uh, just in in uh, you know if you uh, you know if you think different individuals uh, will have differently reactive immune systems, right? Um, they're not. If you give everybody uh, you know in a population uh, becomes infected at one time, they're going to recover at different times, right? And some will get. Some will get uh, more ill than others. Uh, some might develop symptoms, some might not develop symptoms, right? Some may clear the virus almost immediately, some may not. These kinds of differences um, are what, um, you know, give rise to that distribution, really. And this is just sort of a narrative that explains how those differences kind of come about. Okay, okay. If uh, if uh, we find the explanation like this uh, from different immune systems or different responses or different time lags, 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the. I mean, the interesting thing is, is, is you know, then when you say, well, okay, you've got an epidemic going, so you don't have everybody getting infected at the beginning, all at the same time. And so what you find is the distribution changes, but that's that also seems easy to understand, right? Because as I say, we get people, you know, as the epidemic is rising, people are getting infected faster and faster. And so you have more people near the beginning. And as it's falling, there's more time that, uh, you know, people, people that, uh, people that haven't managed to clear it, there'll be more of them. Yes, yes, yes. It makes sense. It makes sense. Okay, thank you. Pleasure. Hey, um, sorry, a couple of other comments. I don't know, Jerome, you want to comment uh, in, in person or? Uh, yeah, oh, okay, my, my mic is fun. No, I was just talking a little bit about counters on the, so what you are asking about uh, localization has uh, already been proposed and I think implemented in the 2010 in Edinburgh uh, by uh, Donald Stewart. That's but, the, the uh, spatial kappa, yeah. Yeah, and it, it has always been difficult to find this article. I, I uh, succeeded many times, but now it's uh, <laughs> more and more difficult. <laughs> but uh, more interestingly, I think, yes, there are many things to do with counters that has not been done. One first uh, thing is that I think that as long as you use a counter in a rates, the rules are expanded to remove counters, which is, uh, sure. I mean, for you, it's transparent, but I think you have better to do because uh, you can see it as a, as a diff, as a, you can no longer use your uh, rule with rate this, but you can do it with rate this. So it, it could be handled as a wake up on inhibitions, just uh, computing the, the diff between the two rates. So uh, I think something must be done in order to avoid to have this expansion. Oh, sorry, uh, sorry for interrupting. Uh, can you say what contours are? Contours? Um, contours is just the way that you can put arithmetics to uh, internal states. So instead of just having strings that you can, uh, for which you can just test equality, uh -huh. you can uh, increment, you can decrement, you can test that something is bigger than uh, a given value. So, so basically conditions and, 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 and updates for numerical attributes. Yeah, you, you yeah. include arithmetics in your structures for uh, internal yeah, states. Yeah. Okay. And I have forgotten what I was. <laughs> so <laughs> no, no, yeah. it's okay. no, that's the the one. To, no, you know, that's so the first thing. Yes. Yeah. And the uh, second thing is that, uh, and I think it's much easier. It's to uh, have a condition about uh, about pairs of markers that occur in the left hand side. It's, uh, it's uh, I mean, it's just a matter of introducing the syntax onto uh, to. Uh, I mean, uh, th there's no difficulty in that. It should be done. Oh, the the kind of you know parameterizing by saying you know this, these two, these two state these two internal states have to be the same whatever yeah. they are. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean of course I can do that with my with my uh, preprocessor that goes no, no, and but, uh, enumerates I, I, it. I but... mean uh, without ex expanding the rules because uh, if, if you you start to expand the rule, it's nice if you have small models. But uh, oh, for, um, absolutely but, uh, yes, yeah, yeah. 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 So it, it just be included in the in the exploration of unbuildings. Yeah, no, that sounds like something that it should be fairly easy to implement. Yeah, okay. I don't mean to put you on the spot, though. I mean, this is this talk is written very much as a uh, a user's perspective of... No, but that's writing. very yeah. nice to have a user request. I mean, to, to see where people want to go. That's very useful. Okay. Um, we'll see it. Uh, if else here. I, I had another question uh, or maybe a sort of high level sort of way of, of scoping this and, and trying to understand basically what you've done and what you're going to do okay and mm -hmm. then tell me whether that's right or wrong so so what I understand I mean I'm familiar with this SIR model okay suspected infected recovered or removed as you said um, and and where you basically have these as three discrete states Okay, so what I understand is that you sort of refined that by looking inside the individual, essentially by, 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 for example, adding a quantity to infected, 
you say so 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 how how much of um, yeah basically viral load is the degree of infection to some extent isn't it so, well in this case it's not even degree of infection it's just infected or not this is just um, these these really are just patterns they're just motifs that get matched in the graph yeah but if you if you count if if you, if you have the, the the viral load if you add the viral load you have kind of a a, a quantification of how how much an individual is infected yes, yes. rather than just the discrete sure. state so that's sort of so but it looks inwards in a sense that it looks sort of refines basically the 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 mechanisms uh, um that talk about individuals yes and then as as you say but and and then basically using using the mass action semantics to to do that for a population of of of, of individuals and and so this is basically what you've done and then now what you're trying to do now is to um basically refine the um if you like at the population level so 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 at as you said network structure potentially or, or how did you call that contact graph um a contact graph yeah well that's there there are actually two there was so there are two things that i that i'm that i'm interested in and they're kind of at opposite ends really mm -hmm. so one is yeah it has to do with uh, the dynamics of populations right so it has to do with uh, you know you do want more structure like that you want um you know you want households and you want schools and you want all of these all of these kinds of things right um which i mean on the one hand actually they say they feel more like hypergraphs than graphs right because a household is i mean you can draw it but but it's, it's sort of more like a um that if we are, are allowed to have a very large number of uh, a very large size vocabulary for internal states we could do that right we could say internal state of these five people has the same you know has the same value they're in the same household mm. and then we can have you know the parameterized transmission for that for that household and that household and it's all the same thing right so that's that, that's fine um so uh so there's that would be necessary in order to uh that kind of thing would be necessary in order to make this a little bit realistic because a lot of the questions have to do with how much transmission is happening in this part of the population or that part of the population. And we were talking just earlier about schools and it seems to be young people and the transmission, where do young people go get together? They get together in schools. So if you want to model that you need, you need actually either schools or age or both. Mm -hmm. Right. So there's that on the other yeah. end. So, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. so that would mean that you would be able to say, for example, if you have a model for that, what would happen? So, what is the effect of 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 uh, uh, closing the sh closing the schools, for example, on on the for example, yes, the... yeah, okay, okay, mm -hmm. um, or as in some other work um, that I uh, some other work that I that I did where we worked with a an Orthodox Jewish population in London and had quite detailed information about households and household structure and uh, what places of worship and what uh, and what schools and where where all the population went and they experienced a very large first wave of the pandemic and the question there was of all of these places which contributed the most and what is the relative risk mm -hmm. of being in this place or being in that place um so yeah all of those kinds of questions um th on the other end uh it is the immune system is very complicated <laughs> there is a lot that goes on there are many processes that happen and uh you know as i said several times i just didn't put them in this model. One of the reasons I didn't put them in this model is because uh, you run into the problem very quickly where you have this kind of narrative of what goes on and it's possible to write these rules, the narrative down as rules. And that's really nice because having a, a sort of formally written down version of the narrative I think is very valuable. But then you have all of these rates that have to do with how fast this rule goes and how fast that rule goes. 
And what are they? You know, you end up with, we only have so much data. It seems to be that the data that we have is about the same, um, you know, contains about the same information as you need to fit the parameters for a model like this. But if you start making the model much more complicated, it becomes underspecified. Um, I'm uh, so well. One of the things I would like to do, and I, I I need to learn more about how immunology, about immunology and immune response, and all these different processes, and what has been measured and what has not been measured. You know, how long does it take a dendritic cell to grab a bit of virus and drag it into a uh, and drag it into a germinal center? Center. I don't know. I'm not. I'm not sure how how much of those things are actually known, um, but that's something that I would like to explore and develop further, because I mean I think it's it's a very expressive way of writing down these models, and I think it's a lot clearer than a lot of what you see, which is normally differential equations and things, and um, and yeah, so that's yeah that's the other end of things yeah, I'm interested yeah, in. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, I let uh, Clemens go first. I had another question, but let's yeah, hear someone else first, please. Jan, on mute, sorry. Yeah. Uh, continue then, please, Heiko. Oh, okay, so just I, I just had a question about the the the, um, the hierarchical. Uh, system, especially the, the motivation for having different rules in different places or different rules in different, uh, uh, I mean, whatever you call location, you could say um, the, the person is a location for the virus or, or the school is a location for people. Um, yeah. So I understand that you want to co compartmentalize it, but I don't really understand why you would have different rules for, for how the virus behaves in different, in different uh, individuals, for example. Oh, I don't think you would. I think you would have, well, okay, you, I mean, you might have some different rules or some differently parameterized versions of the same rule, because you mm. might, you might have an immunocompromised person okay. that has a, you know, less reactive immune systems. You might have that sort of thing happening. Um, or, the, but even without that, you might just have many copies of the same set of rules, mm. or what are notionally many copies. You'd, you'd like to write it down just once, right? But okay, because it could also be interesting to think about how rules are evolved, uh, how rules are evolving. Um, mm -hmm. But maybe that's a different sort of type of question entirely, and then maybe we struggle with simulating that. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm intrigued by that idea. That's, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, no, I've, I've I've thought about that a little bit uh, as well. It's very interesting. Okay. Yeah, sorry, Clemens. Okay, then thank you very much for the talk. I was, yeah, I, I liked it very much. But thank in the you. first instance, I understand your work a little bit as trying to find out, uh, let's say, mathematically reasons, uh, quantitative reasons behind, uh, yeah, biologically uh, me me mechanisms. Uh, and, and that's what I now want to ask, may perhaps sound a little bit critical, but uh, it's just an honest question. Uh, isn't it so that until now you have tried to, let's say that what one calls retrofit, your model against existing data wouldn't be somehow uh, a little bit the challenge for you to to make predictions for some some uh, existing situations and then uh, let's say about vaccine effectiveness and then let uh, uh, biologists test that so in order to have a little bit more confidence in your models but at the end, I want to, to go back as an analysis mechanism. I find this really great. And let me pl please con congratulate you on your work. Well, thank you. Um, but no, you're, uh, you're, you're right. Um, there's what I've, what I've, what I've shown here is not, uh, not especially predictive. And uh, I mean, you can say that, okay, you know, that the, the bit at the bit at the end, uh, which is more easily measurable than trying to measure, you know, trying to trying to get the trajectory of viral load an individual, that sort of thing. 
um, you know, you can say, well, if we have an epidemic and it's a place with poor, um, uh, uh, small amount of testing, right? And you can only do a small amount of surveillance testing, but you can't test people in in very large numbers, which is the case in many low and middle income countries. And what you want to know is where is the epidemic in its trajectory? Um, this, uh, you know, shows a way that you might be able to do that. However, um, it doesn't show more of a way that you might be able to do that on top of the empirical work that's already been done for that, right? By, you know, James, James Hay and colleagues who looked at actual data and then said, okay, this is how we can estimate the reproduction number and so on and so forth. Uh, so it doesn't really add much on top of that, but it does maybe put it on a, um, you know, it gives a nice, a nice clean theoretical example of why that should be the case. Um, Predicting response of, um, so uh, yeah, predicting what is going on between vaccines and, vi and the virus, and especially with mutations of the virus, is something that is, uh, is something that I'm, something that I am interested in and working on, because uh, you know, we have this strategy that's going on right now where um, we have vaccines that are designed to elicit a response to a uh, some proteins that the virus had two years ago, right? And when we have a new variant come, the uh, our response to that seems to be to give people a lot of these vaccines for an old virus. And it seems to me now. This is getting into them. This is this is a little bit. This is a little bit speculative. But this is what I think is going on, right? It seems to me that what's happening is you get a large amount of antibodies from these boosters for a relatively short period of time. They are not particularly well tuned to the new um, to the new the new flavor of virus, but there are so many of them. That they have that they're enough right and then there and then i think that there is a second effect that when you become infected with this new virus well you have b cells that are very well tuned to an old kind of virus um but you also probably have b cells that are sort of half optimized you know and that can then become further optimized to the new kind of um, virus. So there's, I mean, the answer is kind of yes, but it needs a lot more detail of and yeah. what's what's going on, what's going on there, and that's um, yeah. yeah. I'm sorry, just to to interrupt you, just to give you some, uh, uh, I mean, answers, but it's not me that I'm going to answer. There is uh, now a uh, lot of papers uh, like. Uh, uh, who, uh, analyze the the immune cell response to omicron for example mm -hmm. and we now know exactly the the role of t cells and b cells mm -hmm. because you have uh, two two kinds of cells yes and uh, uh so you 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 should get uh, really uh, a good story about uh, T cells and B cells reading these papers. And the uh, story is not, uh, is not like what you said, but uh, with these papers, you can, you can have, you can have a good story for your model. Okay, that would be I mean, if you have, if you have some examples of papers that you think the particular ones that you think I should read, I would be glad to have them. Yes, I, I will try to send them to you. It's just that I read them uh, two months ago or something like this. But I, I try to, to find them again and send them to you. Lovely, thank you. But clearly, uh, uh, you, you get, after reading them, a clear uh, view about uh, what the immune system does and why the booster is... Uh, necessary but doesn't work that well etc or 
it's not uh, it's only uh, i mean uh, uh, b cells doesn't work a lot in this model uh, in in front of omicron because if you see uh, omicron but uh, this is a lot of uh, this is bio, uh, biology papers i mean omicron has mutated on the spike Yes, he has a lot of mutation on the spike, so that's why, uh, uh, like uh, vaccines like Pfizer, Moderna, who, who are built on on the spike system. I mean, uh, to they don't uh, they are not so efficient. Yes, yes, this is this is as I as I was. I thought yes. I was saying that. And I meant to say that. You said something uh, which may, uh, which uh, uh, is uh, has a high probability to be true. Is that uh, uh, if you if you put inside the body a huge, uh, I mean, uh, like double quantity of uh, mRNA uh, vaccine, it will protect you better. They have some 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 results on this. But mm -hmm. it's still preliminary. I mean, like uh, for example, when you put uh, you you had the two doses of uh, Pfizer, and then you you the, your third dose is about Moderna. Moderna is uh, has a double dose of uh, of uh, RNA, and uh, that gives uh, long term protection about. Uh, 20% higher than if you put uh, uh, Pfizer uh, as a third dose. I can believe that. I can also, I, I mean, I can believe that this as well. This is proven. Yeah. Is uh, I mean, as as well, because of giving a, well, there's details, but I mean, a, um, it's, I think it is still an open question. Yes, whether but we know the, some, some, something like this. Yeah, but the the open we question have papers about that, but not so that don't go deeper than that. Yeah, for sure. Well, I think I think yeah. There's a, but the the an open question that I think we have is is it better to produce a slightly broader response or a very strong narrow response? What do you mean by narrow uh, concerning uh, immu immune cells? Because I don't understand. What do you mean by narrow biologically? I mean, right. So what I mean is, if you give um, so one of the re so if you give a um, an mRNA vaccine with mm -hmm. a single sequence, um, and you give enough of it so that so that you get a you get uh, you know. B cells and antibodies with very high affinity. That's one strategy. Another strategy is you give, for example, just imagine such a thing existed. You give a vaccine that has a variety of yes. nearby sequences, but not as much of them. Because yes, I yeah. understand what you say. It's the it's the option. I mean, it's the theory of the what they call in French uh, or in. In a, in a, I mean, in English, the general purpose vaccine, but uh, it doesn't. Uh, it it is is uh, is. Um, I mean, uh, research on this vaccine is still on uh, animal models. It's really, really very prelimi pre preliminary. Sure. But what we noticed now, I mean, uh, the strategy of Pfizer and Moderna is to produce. Uh, uh, an Omicron uh, specific vaccine. Yes, I mean that's that's the obvious thing. Uh, well, yes. I mean it's the obvious thing to do, except that by the time it's ready, yes. there will be something yes. new. But they, they, I mean, uh, they choose this strategy because there is a demand from some certain uh, countries. So, so it's also the demands that creates the vaccine, and. Uh, they didn't choose uh, the general purpose vaccine because they don't know how to do it. Huh? Sure, it's, sure. There is, there is one researcher I heard a long time ago, I mean, months ago, that works on general purpose vaccine in University of California. I don't remember, but he's still very, very preliminarily working on, on 
on mice or something. Really, really another technique than the spike vaccine. But uh, sure. of course, it would be better because uh, we'll have, uh, I mean... Uh, but but if we were to, for, f for example, if you were to imagine one that took a uh, spike sequence from each of the major lineages of the COVID and take that. It's not quite general purpose, general purpose for anything. Mm -hmm. um, but but it's, it's, it's the definition of general purpose vaccine. Okay. What, what you... <laughs> yes, yes. It's, it's the, the, the right uh, definition of general purpose vaccine. Because uh, if I remember, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine is just, uh, they took just the sequence of the spike. But Omicron, uh, it's uh, it's the evolution theory. Uh, I mean, uh, like uh, understood that and uh, mutated uh, uh, mainly on the spike. There is like sure. sixty okay. mutations, so, a huge so, number on the spike. Sorry to interrupt, but can we close this part of the discussion for now? Because I think okay. we're getting very specific, and yes. I think the purpose of this. Uh, talk anyway, or even the suggestion of the future work here wasn't necessarily to to say that that one is good and the other is bad, or what are the different um, so kind of biological yeah, mechanisms. But 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 to see whether we can have a method that can maybe predict which kind of general strategy could 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 work out in which way. So so without necessarily judging. If it's possible to to develop such a vaccine, yeah, so, but yeah, anyway, yeah, so uh, maybe also to bring the discussion a little bit back to because I mean it was mainly also about the methods here at the talk uh, about how to actually simulate these models. And what's interesting is that the models he showed were actually not after writing models per se, because uh, for example, this model here it is still one that can, could be unfolded into a petri net, yes, because essentially you you're giving a model where, as you said, you don't have actual, I mean graphical interaction other than that you have a certain coupling be between certain types of species but the coupling is sort of uh, implicit in the sense that uh, basically this is i mean in the terminology of kappa you could still produce a network of i mean infinitely many species because you don't have a bound on the counter but i mean you could still you know run this as a chemical reaction system which is on one hand good because then you're relatively sure the averages are sharp enough that a simulation can give a meaningful result but the, the question is exactly in this moment when you would go to, as you said, either by the spatial aspect to a graphical model or by the community aspect, then we would exactly run into this question, how many parameters could you actually sort of imagine to be precise enough so that you can still get a meaningful result from a simulation? Yes. Yeah? So, I mean, it's, it's, I guess it's a bit the question what you can get from such a model, whether you can get sort of a general trend or how, how mechanistic you can get, yes. Uh, well, I mean, I think um, you're you're right, of course. Technically, you're technically mm -hmm. correct. The best kind of correct um, <laughs> that <laughs> that you can that you, <laughs> right. There's 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 nothing here that you couldn't do as a petri net, except that even with the bound on the counters that we that I use in practice, which is I think I use twenty or something like that, mm -mm. I mean you would need to end up you would need something like I think it was eight thousand or so places and you know sixty four million interactions, you're not gonna get an ODE system out of that. No 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 exactly yeah. Yes, yeah. that's that's sort of the classical byline for Kappa for the simul. I mean, this particular simulator is fully optimized for taking advantage from exactly this sort of state place, uh, well, transition and state space explosion. Yeah, no, no, but I, I meant more like um, sort of in the in the group here we are discussing a lot about these graph transformations, and and there sort of the question is always how do you get to the rates for such graph transformations? The moment you yeah. make a mechanistic assumption like this one. I mean, here it's mild because really the mechanism itself is not very graphical. You just say that if you if you find two agents that are linked, but I mean, there is no more links they can have. I mean, these uh, yeah. two yeah, agents, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, they, they have a link or they don't, but I mean, it's not that you can have an actual graphical structure. So if you do find it, you always find it in the similar configuration. So you just can give the total count and the simulator can just search for bits. I yeah. mean, the, the, the sort of the kappa bit is that you can have a bound on number of links 
And so you, you, you sort of, you're still very granular. And then the question is like, once you go to spatial distributions, um, how much of that survives? So my gut feeling is you would want to ask a statistical network person um, because normally these things still have regularities. You can still get sort of the average, the expected number of links or something like that. You presumably well, want to massage your mechanism more in the direction that you make a slightly refined version where you don't actually take spatial distribution, but you just take sort of the expected values of being linked as another external mechanism parameter. I mean, my, my gut feeling is that would be more successful than trying to have an actual spatial model because that, I mean, that has its own difficulties. Um, I think, um, well, I mean, you're also right that I have deliberately kept to mm -hmm. an area like the kind of sweet spot of where I know Kappa does very well because it turns out to be mm -hmm. very productive. Well, yeah, um, sure, sure. Um, but, uh, but no, you're right. And I mean, I have so there's 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 kind of two things you could do here right i mean mm. so this uh, this is this transmission one is the one you want to look at because it's it has you know it's sure. it's where we might want more structure um so you could say uh this happens if these two people have a bond between them right mm -hmm. and then you immediately get a little bit beyond what Kappa is is happy with, because you might want people to have bonds to more than one person, right? There's mm -hmm. you know more than one person yeah, exactly. lives in a household or whatever. Um, so you might do it like that, but um, and yeah, sorry, sorry, but exactly that. Uh, so so here, presumably, you would go to your population statistic. I mean, maybe people have at most six children or. <laughs> In Europe, presumably more likely, yeah, yeah. let's say, a max of three or whatnot. I mean, some reasonable bounds, there's, which there's is work maybe on, not covering all the cases, but... There's you know. work on generating networks that are representative of populations. No, but I mean, you could still yeah. do that with Kappa. You could still have sort of a mini model of a family would still be a sort of explainable number of, of, of configurations. Um, so you basically have maybe family of zero, one, two, or three children, it would not completely blow up your, your, your model. I'm just wondering, because of course you can introduce a lot of different transitions, but you still would have to come up with the statistical parameter for it, which is, I mean, yes. we discussed with Reiko a lot, these social network models. You can make very generic models for a social network. It's just that then how do you come up with the rates? I mean, you have to either measure them from data or you can, yep. I mean, you cannot just guess them. That's, that's and, and in, moreover, you're doing simulations, you're not doing ODE systems. You're doing simulations. You want to get trajectories which are representative of your of your model. Yes. So, yeah. yeah. And no, no. But I mean, it's it's interesting work. It's also, I, I guess, it's the same thing as a physicist game. You try to get the simplest model that can roughly explain. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's that's exactly yeah. the strategy. I didn't actually talk very much about fitting this, um, mm -hmm. but I guess the technique for fitting it was using uh, ABC, the approximate Bayesian computation. Mm -hmm. uh, right, where what you what you give it is a distance measure yeah. between whatever it produces and whatever you want it to produce, mm -hmm. and some prior distributions for the parameters, and then right. you run it a m zillions of times, mm -hmm. and it refines the priors into posterior distributions of what it thinks the parameters should be. No, but, but, but again, like I, I guess the type of model you're producing is still sort of empirical in the sense that you're, you're trying to maybe produce a simple enough mechanistic model to get close to realistic data, but you couldn't expect to actually explain anything mechanistically. It's just that more the mechanism is used to get sort of a tractable model that might be extendable when you have new effects. Yes. I mean, it's not, I, I think it's interesting that you get to a similar behavior, but then also the question of is it similar depends a lot on the level of detail you're looking at, I guess. So, yes. And and there's also the uh, the sort of necessary uh, versus sufficient, right? Yeah. So this is sufficient to produce something that looks like that, but is it mm -hmm. right? Is, does it have to be like this? No, no, but, but again, yeah, like, yeah. So, so even if you would modify your model by having different variants of these transitions, maybe for maybe yeah. you you stratify a bit, as you said, by age or by by by, by number of members in the family or whatnot. Uh, this already starts to introduce a lot of parameters, which you would then have to fit. But I mean, yep. the question is, where's the sp sweet spot? How how many details can you introduce without breaking your link to the actual empirical data? Um, I think it would be interesting to see in future yeah. how far you can drive this. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, thanks uh, thanks all for the talk. It was quite interesting. <laughs> um, thank you for having me. I'm glad you enjoyed it.
Yeah, well, Satan certainly raised a lot of discussion. So that is that is that is the purpose of these things. So. Excellent. Okay, so um, I, I think we can probably close the official part of the seminar then um, and switch off the live stream. So thank you very much again, William, and and everyone who joined and asked questions and and sort of commented on the chat, etc. Um, I don't know, Nicholas, do you want to advertise the next week? Um, Oh yeah, yeah. So it's in two weeks. We have Pablo Arrighi telling us about some links between graph transformation theory and quantum physics. So quite a different topic, but should also be interesting. And yeah, also from my side, thanks again, William. And uh, we will now close the live stream. Should anybody still wish to quickly have a chat with William, uh, we stay on Zoom. So there's a Zoom link also on the YouTube channel. But uh, we will now close the stream. So thanks again to everybody, and until next time.